about fitness is brought to you by TerraCore. TerraCoreFitness.com. T-E-R-R-A CoreFitness.com. Check it out and see why Men's Health voted TerraCore as one of the top 25 fitness products you should have for your home. It's a bench, a platform, a step, an agility tool. You can train on it a variety of different ways to get the results you want. Go to TerraCoreFitness.com and use code AAF10. That's code AAF10 to save 10% on the purchase of a TerraCore. All About Fitness is also brought to you by HyperWare. That's HyperWare.com. HyperWare is the maker of the soft bells, the sand bells, and the vest. The soft bells and sand bells are unique sandbags. The, sand, the soft bells you can turn into dumbbells, a kettlebell, a barbell, and the sand bells are unique sandbags that you can use for all types of strength training exercises. Check out the link in the show notes and you can go to HyperWare.com and you can use code AAF10 to save 10% on the purchase of sand bells for use at home or your facility. I like sand bells so much, I included them in my new book, Smarter Workouts, coming out from Human Kinetics. I'm Pete McCall, and welcome to episode 127 of All About Fitness. Before I get into the introduction for this episode's guest, recently I was in Philadelphia and Chicago for the SEW Mania Series conferences, and to those folks I met in Philadelphia, Jesse, Morgan, Ashlyn, and Christine Connie, I want to say thank you very much for tuning in. And thanks for taking the time to come by and visit my session. And to those of you who joined me in Chicago for Midwest Mania with SCW, I want to say thank you for taking the time to come to my sessions. It means a lot that you you decide to come visit me for one of your conference sessions, and really hopefully you got some good stuff out of that. On this episode, I am super excited. It took me a while to book this guest. I met him in person a number of years ago. We talk about that just briefly. He's extremely in demand. And he's been one of the people who have literally changed the way that we do fitness over the past 10 years or so. And that's Thomas Myers. In 2013, I did an anatomy workshop. Thomas Myers led the cadaver portion where we literally got to dissect a cadaver. And we talk about that a little bit. So Thomas Myers did the cadaver portion. The next day, it was taught by Michelle Dalcourt and Rodney Korn, two of the top educators on movement. Now, to let you know, I would have been extremely happy to watch... Thomas, Thomas developed the concept of anatomy trains. His book, which is now in its third edition, has quite literally changed the way that we look at the human body, at least from a fitness education standpoint. I definitely have a link, link to his book down in the show notes below. And if you want to learn more about the body, if you really just want to blow your mind about how the body is designed to work, I really, you're going to get a lot out of this podcast, and I highly recommend that you invest in anatomy trains. It really has been, I've bought all three editions, and I, I devour it on a regular basis because it really teaches us a lot about the body. Back to the first anatomy live workshop that Thomas taught in 2013, I would have been happy to watch him do the dissection and see how the fascial lines connect. But we show up, and this was a cadaver lab, and these were fresh tissue cadavers donated by the deceased family, and so there's a lot of, I really want to say thank you to those, anybody who's had their family member donated to science, it does mean a lot. We take it seriously. It really was an overwhelming experience to do a cadaver dissection, especially because these cadavers were not preserved by chemicals. They were fresh tissue cadavers. It was a very overwhelming experience on a number of different levels. But what it allowed me to do was to see how the human body is connected, to see how the layers of fascia connect between all the layers of muscle. And Thomas, you know, by the end of the day, Thomas took us through some of how he designed or how, not designed, but how how he identifies the anatomy trains. On this episode of All About Fitness, Thomas shares how he got started down this path, the influence that Ida Rolf had on him, and what sailing has to do with understanding how the human body works. Now, I know I say this quite a bit, but on this episode, I really am truly honored. This was a fanboy geek out session for me to sit down and have this conversation with Mr. Myers because I truly respect his work and truly appreciate everything that he has done to change the way that we look at the human body. So on this episode of All About Fitness, Mr. Thomas Myers, developer of the Anatomy Trains concept and author of Anatomy Trains, third edition. I'm Pete McCall of the All About Fitness podcast, and I'm speaking today with author and soft tissue expert Thomas Myers. Thomas, quick question uh, as we get started. I, I saw one of your videos a number of years ago about a sailboat, about, and, and you, you're, you love sailing. How does a sailboat relate to the human body? 
Well, I, I would relate to that in two ways. Uh, when you're training somebody, I, I do body work uh, much more than training, but um, it requires all your senses. You're, you're feeling the person, you're seeing the person, you're listening to what they say. Uh, you're listening to the sound of their footfalls on the floor, uh, maybe the sound of whatever equipment they're using. All of those things give you a guide to how they are. So one way in which sailing is really important to me is is it's training for my senses. Uh, you're, you're all the time listening to the boat, feeling the boat, uh, watching how things are going, and, and that kind of all senses on deck. Uh, thing is something that connects my work and and sailing and makes sailing for me part of my training from my work. Um, but I think the way you were going at the question was that uh, a sailboat is somewhat like a human being in that uh, we have really had the idea that we're more like a building and that we're one brick on top of another brick. So we have the idea of the skeletal frame and that the leg stands on the foot and the thigh stands on the leg and the pelvis fits into the top of the femurs and that that's a framework and that the muscles are individual actors like the cables of a crane on that stable framework. So the deltoid is going to abduct because it's hanging onto a stable shoulder girdle and pulling on the more movable humerus. But that's really not the way it works here. Your skeletal framework, even if you put all the joint tissues on it and all the ligaments on it, uh, it still wouldn't stand up. It would just sag. It depends on the balance of the, the soft tissues, which is a combination of those tendons and ligaments, but of course the muscles which are run by the nerves. So that uh, really suggests itself something more like a sailboat where the mast is light, like your spine is really quite light. Have you ever picked up a, a real human spine? They're, it's not a big heavy thing for all the weight that it's carrying, the head up at the one end, all the weight of the chest in the middle, the weight of the pelvis and upper legs uh, at the bottom, and yet the spine itself is is really quite a light thing. So we see the bones more as spacers that are pushing out against the soft tissue and the soft tissue being both muscles and fascia as pulling in on the skeleton. And it's the balance between those two that gives you your posture. And uh, especially for the trainers who are listening, I would say this isn't just posture, this is posture in action or what Feldenkrais, another teacher of mine, uh, used to call actor, posture in action. So you can recognize somebody, you can recognize a friend from two blocks down the street in New York before you can ever see their face. You can recognize them by their pattern of movement. Everybody has a signature movement as much as they have a signature iris to the eye or a signature fingerprint. And we're quite good at recognizing those patterns of movement. And uh, that is a matter of the mind shaping the muscles the muscles the, the fascia then shaping itself around the muscles depending on the forces that are going and even the bones will change shape especially if the forces change the younger you are the more the bones are going to change shape i'm totally silver haired now so my bones aren't changing shape much anymore but a, but a kid will change the shape of the bones for instance if you send a kid to dance camp um you, and you take a picture of your daughter's feet um before she goes to dance camp and after she comes home, so the bones will be thicker and shaped differently just because she's been spending so many hours in that specialized activity. So again, you, your um, customers, your uh, clients who are doing the same activity time after time, if they're a professional athlete, are going to shape their bones in, and the soft tissues in particular ways. We often think about it just in terms of neurological habit. We have to understand that the tissues have a habit too. I've really gone on for a long time here. I apologize. No, that's well, that's that's <laughs> perfect, Tom. And, and just you know, my, my I try to go after a general. My listenership, uh, the audience tends to be the over thirty five, over the age of thirty five fitness enthusiasts. And you know, I, I'm a fitness educator, and what I try to do is I try to put information out there for how people can maintain their favorite activities well into the later years. How did you get how did you get started in soft tissue work? What what sent you down that path? Uh. Well, we're, we're talking in California. I happen to be in California now, and you are. Um, I was born on the East Coast and was raised very much up in, in, my, uh, in that kind of New Englandy, <laughs> don't pay attention to your body kind of, of uh, upbringing. And in the early 1970s, the 
America was tipped and everything that was loose started rolling towards California. So I did, I was loose and I rolled into California and picked up on what was called at the time, the human potential movement. It's kind of called new age or alternative medicine now, but, um, yeah, and then it had the, the nickname human potential movement. So I was studying Tai Chi, learning Aikido, learning meditation, doing yoga. Um, it was all this sort of Eastern stuff that was pouring into the uh, culture of California at that time. And I got caught up in that. And I, the, one of the people on this circuit uh, was Ida Rolf and the idea of being Rolf, having your body Rolfed over, very strongly worked over the whole thing was the general idea. And anyway, uh, I'd heard it had good things, so I went down to see this woman, and I went down with a friend of mine, and he was one of these people, uh, I was living in a house with him, he was a roommate at the time, he was one of these people that you looked normal when you looked at him from the front, but when you looked at him from the side, you couldn't see him, because his chest was so close to his back, he was just really thin front to back, and um, she went to work on him, and, and in 45 minutes, he stood up, and his chest was deeper, and his voice was deeper, and I, I thought, that's pretty useful magic to be able to change somebody's shape like that in uh, such a short time. And I have been fascinated with it for 45 years since. I have never stopped. I, I've been pretty much a workaholic doing this kind of work uh, for years, and it doesn't doesn't substitute for training um, because I can change the fascia around, but that's not going to develop the muscles or uh, develop neuromuscular coordination. That's a product of how you move, how often you move, when you move, um, that, and, and what kind of movement you do. But I can reach into the body in places where yoga doesn't reach, training doesn't reach, or where the person themselves simply hasn't reached, or fourth category, uh, the places where they've been traumatized and kind of seized up the body, whether that's surgery, broken bones, athletic injuries, uh, any of those things produce scar tissue. And essentially, my job is to go in, find that scar tissue, and comb it out. And, and that, I get sorry. Go ahead. Yep. Well, well, I'm done. Well, I was going to say that oh. that that I think yeah. is people don't realize how str you're saying it's structural. We're not built as a specific structure. But I think a lot of people don't realize the difference between muscle and the soft tissues, the fascia and connective tissue. What would you like if you could just you know, wave a magic wand, Tom, and get the general public to understand more about fascia? You've written about it in your books, and I know you speak about it on various lecture circuits. But if you could just impart the information about fascia and soft tissue, what would you like to share? What, what information do you think people should know about that part of their body? It's pretty much been a, a Cinderella of the body tissues in that it's been there all the time, but nobody recognized it for what it is. It's the packing material that you throw away. Um, and it turns out to be a very dynamic system. We have studied it as individual muscles. We uh, do individual ligaments or iliotibial tract or... Uh, the central tendon of the diaphragm, we isolate out individual soft tissue structures. But if you imagine how you're held together, you're actually 70 trillion, we don't even know how many, but on the order of 70 trillion cells acting as Pete McCall. You, know, you get up every morning as Pete McCall, but actually 70 trillion cells have been living that entire 24 hours um, and having to have food delivered to them, have their garbage taken away, and to be able to do their job, which they do more or less well, depending on the, on the conditions in which they're doing it. And we've thought a lot about the fitness industry, has thought a lot about the juicy conditions that those cells are in, in terms of your nutrition and your hydration and perfusion and circulation, getting everything around. But those cells are also handling a mechanical environment. We tend to think of ourselves as a machine where the muscles and bones are acting as as units, but the muscles are made up of cells, the bones are made by cells, and the soft tissue that surrounds it doesn't just surround the muscles and bones, it surrounds, it goes through your liver and around your liver, it goes through your kidney and around your kidney, it goes through your heart and around your heart, there's like two, everything is double bagged in the body, your brain is double bagged, your heart is double bagged, your lungs are double bagged, your intestines are double bagged. And those bags are made out of fascia. Every nerve that goes, your sciatic nerve, as it goes down through 
uh, your leg, if you take out the sciatic nerve and look at it, it's 65% fascia within the nerve, and then it's surrounded by one, two, three layers of fascia um, around each nerve bundle. So you're, when you feel the sciatic nerve, you're mostly feeling fascia. Yes, it's a nerve. We call it a nerve, um, but it's about 35% nerve. It's about two-thirds fascia and one-third nerve because the nerves are so delicate that they need all that fascia to protect them, number one. And number two, they need the fat, which is another soft tissue, a very important soft tissue, to hold them apart by insulation for the wires. Um, so the fascia is surrounding and going through everything. By fascia, I mean the soft tissues are surrounding and going through everything. Uh, so it's a system that we haven't thought about because it's so pervasive that uh, it's kind of an environment that we missed. And and that's that's one thing that I think is fascinating about your work is you're really explaining the body in a much greater detail that I think most people just fail to view. And, and I know you, your your expertise is 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 as a therapist and not as an exercise person. But what types of movements, what types of exercises should people be doing for the fascia? Because it's different than just regular traditional exercises to strengthen the muscle, correct? Yes. Every exercise that you do to strengthen the muscle also strengthens the fascia. We know a few things about the fascia that don't apply to muscle that um, are really important. One is its viscosity. Um, it's a gel it's a little bit like that stuff that you see on the internet where guys run across a pool but and stay on top of it, but if they stand in the middle of the pool, they sink into it. It's a, like a mixture of cornstarch and, and water. And your body is colloidal like that cornstarch and water or like silly putty or slime so that when you whack uh, – if, if you just right now take your hands and clap them together um, – it doesn't hurt your fingers, even though your bones are really just under your skin. The reason it doesn't, if you if you press your hands together now like you're praying, and but just keep pressing your hands together, pushing your elbows together, and rub your hands up and down a little bit, you'll feel the bones. They're, they're right there. How come we don't crack up our bones when, uh, when we do impact sports, landing from a high jump or catching a fastball? Uh, how come things don't break apart? Because the soft tissue is viscous and it spreads everything. We tend to think of the fascia as just being fiber, but it's also a gel. And that the viscosity of that gel is very important to um, protect our bodies. And, that, and unfortunately, we're just beginning to study that gel. There's hyaluronon, mucopolysaccharides, uh, fibronectin, lots and lots of long words for how this stuff handles impact. So we're going to learn a lot about how joints work by handling, by learning how this gel works. Then we have the fibers. Now we know this. Okay, number first was the viscosity. Number two is elasticity. We know muscle is elastic, but we now know fascia is elastic too. And that you, when you're bouncing along, when you're doing cyclic movements of well, I'm not going to go into all the <laughs> restrictions, but when you're doing cyclic movements like walking and running. Um, bouncing, uh, jumping rope of any kind, you're building the elasticity in the fascia and the body. And if you think about it, elasticity is a product of youth, isn't it? It's an attribute of youth. Uh, if grandma falls downstairs, it may be very different if Johnny, who's two years old, falls downstairs. Uh, because of the elasticity of the body, Johnny might cry, but he won't be hurt. And grandma may not cry, but she may well be really hurt. Um, so, <laughs> At age 55, I started saying, okay, if uh, I read the research that said you can train elasticity into your fascia. So I said, okay, if it's an attribute of youth and I can train it into my fascia, that's when I started forefoot running. I'm not suggesting forefoot running for anybody else. It worked for me. I just bounce around uh, the blocks around my house uh, five times a week or so to keep myself elastic and it's really, I'm 70 now and I'm, I'm very happily still <laughs> bouncing along. Uh, so maintaining the elasticity of your fascia is very important. And third, the plasticity. Do you want me to keep going? Or do you want me to stop Actually, if, you, if you stop, no, if you stop at plasticity, uh -huh. I, I think that'd be, that'd be perfect. I think, you know, people can follow, most listeners can be able to follow that. Yeah. Um, so if you, uh, grab a carrier bag, any piece of plastic, and you stretch it out, you can usually put a stretch in a shopping bag or anything like that. And if you let it go, the stretch will still be there. 
if you do it too fast, it's going to tear. If you don't do it enough, you're, it's just going to stay where it is. But if you give just the right kind of pull on something. This is what the yoga folks were thinking about with the long stretches, was to give the chance for the fascia to uh, retain some glide uh, in amongst the various structures. And it's it's too long to go through all the different kinds of, of fascia inside a muscle. There's there, Well, I will. There's <laughs> fascia right around each muscle cell, the paramecium, uh, the uh, endomesium, and then there's kind of gliding fascia within the muscle. It's like lube, a lube layer within the muscle. And then there's the fiber outside the muscle, the epimesium, which is what we all think of as, you know, we all know the muscles are come in their own saran wrap coating. Um, but anyway, to, uh, to go through all that would be, uh, in detail, would be too much. But all of that stuff together is elastic and um if you train elasticity like the kenyan runners who have very long shanks uh were able to store and use the elasticity in their tendons like a kangaroo to conserve energy for the, and win the marathons um so using that elasticity and elasticity in the fascia is a um a really good thing going trying to move the fascia too too fast is what tears it and that is the source of almost all the injuries. Well, and, and let me ask, because any movement, I think any high quality mover, whether that's a, that's a runner or a dancer or an athlete, you know, moving, you know, in multiple directions, you know, maybe a martial artist might be a better example, but any high quality mover, isn't it just a matter of storing and releasing mechanical energy through the fascia? Yes. For instance, if you, if you, jump up for a basketball hoop and you want to bounce up there again to get the rebound, you hit the ground with muscles that are in isometric contraction. You store the elasticity in the fascia and then it's a very slight uh, concentric contraction that gets you up in the air again. You're mostly just bouncing off an elastic band. If, on the other hand, to get the rebound you needed to stay on the ground, you would actually eccentrically let go of your muscle at the very moment of landing to stop yourself from bouncing, right? The natural thing as a rubber ball would be to bounce, but you can dampen that by how you use your muscles at the moment that you land to not have that bounce happen, to absorb the elastic energy. So it's not just fascia. Muscles and fascia are bouncing that energy back and forth on a second-by-second -second basis all over your body to give you the stability and mobility that you need at the moment that you need it. Now, it, and Robert Schleip has written about this in some of his work. He suggested that through the various movements, and, and you've written about this too, with the multidirectional movement patterns and vectors, is it possible to create a more youthful fascial architecture? If I'm, you know, in my 50s, 60s, or, you know, it, you know it, or above, um, can I move, can I work to create a more elastic tissue structure within the body? You certainly, I, I feel like I'm living proof of that. And yes, it's being proven all around us. Robert, um, with his ideas of fascial fitness and other people are, are developing programs. So you, as I say, we're just at the beginning of this. So we, um, people are beginning to say, oh yeah, I know about fascia. I do foam rolling. It's so much, it's so much more than just whether you're, uh, doing foam rolling. It's, it's a question of how those forces are best used uh, in different parts of athletics and, and, um, we've been training fascia all the time. It's not like fascia is new. The fascia has been there all the time. It's just a question of whether we can do a better job if we do it consciously. Um, one of the things for instance, is that fascia develops more slowly than muscle. So if you want to strengthen your tendons or strengthen the elasticity in your tendons, you have to be thinking of a six week to six month program. Um, to really get that benefit to go all over your body. It's the, the half-life of fascia is slower than the half-life of muscle. Muscle, because there's so much blood in it, it turns over very quickly, but fascia turns over very slowly. You, you may have molecules in your Achilles tendon that were there when you were born. That's uh, how stable the Achilles tendon is. But most areas of the body are turning over all the time, but fascia turns over more slowly. So... Uh, you know, the, the martial arts guys in the old days and the yoga guys in the old days said, you're going to have to be with us for two years to get the real benefit of that. And, and that two years is pretty much what the um, 
you, you can be sure you've turned over your fascia by the time you've been doing a program for two years, whether that's a program of diet or a program of exercise, that the, most of the fascia has turned over in your body in 24 months. Well, in that, so, in that, go ahead. Yeah, so, so just be thinking more long term in terms of your exercise programs. In, uh, people who come in and say, oh, I want to get buff in the next five weeks because I'm going on vacation or I got a new girlfriend or whatever it is, those are the ones most likely to injure because they're uh, developing the muscles faster than they're developing the tendons to support the muscles. And, and that's that's a great point. I'm going to make a couple comments about that after that because I really want to respect your time. One of the things that, you know, in reading through your, your biography, Tom, I noticed that you spent some time in Europe and specifically maybe studying architecture. How has your, your study of that field influenced your work on the body? Uh, there's two ways in which that's a kind of fascinating thing. One, one is the space around you shapes how you move. So the kind of architecture that we create shapes how we move. I, I really get um, discouraged about schools which are often built you know, at fairly low levels of architecture um, because everybody's under budget um, constraints. But uh, uh, churches create a particular feel about them. Public squares create um, certain feel to it. And, and and they've been thinking about that kind of thing in Europe for a long time, where Los Angeles doesn't have a lot of uh, public square type activity, although they've been bringing that back. But the cities of Europe, um, for instance, I was just in Moscow, they had just wonderful set of places where the public gathers and they have a cappella groups, or it just brings out the people to come out in public and move in different ways. Um, we in America, we people run outside, usually on a track, but we drive somewhere and park in a parking lot and go somewhere to exercise. It's a really weird um, thing that's happened to modern people. You got your exercise in the course of life itself. Now we're training for exercise, which makes sense if you're a performer, either an artistic performer or an athletic performer, that makes a lot of sense. Um, but our daily lives have gotten so sedentary that we have to go to a gym to move and so we need to we need to figure out what are the daily minimum movement requirements because when you, in agricultural life or in uh, paleological life, you know the the olden Neolithic days, uh, life provided plenty of necessity for movement, but life doesn't provide much necessity for movement now. And I think that's that's interesting because no, I, and I've tr I've had the opportunity to be in Moscow just there a few months ago. And I've done some work in China recently. And you're right, because people there are much more apt to go out. The social environment is much more communal. And do you think that that has an impact on overall how we move? Uh, yes, but there are so many factors there. I wouldn't want to pin one down. It's, uh, it's absolutely different to move in China or Japan, uh, and China and Japan are as different as Sweden and Italy. You know, you, you if you talked in Sweden the way they talk in Italy, you just you – know, <laughs> if you, well, if you what, go to Europe, what, see what, those guys that um, So how we move is very much determined by our television culture, our uh, – the fact of the, us being in cars so much. Uh, our children's lives are circumscribed by uh, how much we protect them and keep them in buildings and – don't let them go free outside. Um, a lot of those social structures are definitely affecting how we move and definitely making it necessary for the training industry to exist. We need to find out what are the minimum requirements of movement for the muscles, for the fascia, for the nervous system, um, because kids are getting less and less of that kind of stimulation and, uh, you know, healthy mind and a healthy body. They said that in 500 AD and it's getting more and more true every year. Well, one thing to point out to listeners, Tom, because this is this is one consistent thread with almost with most of the people I interview, you know, whether it's Stuart McGill or, or other people, no, the more people know, like you have a very, I, I would probably say, argue that you're probably one of the top few experts in the world in your field. But the more that people know, I find the more hesitant they are to give a definitive answer. Like, and whereas sometimes with the people that have less knowledge are extremely definitive about about this is what you need to be doing for exercise. Is that something that you've observed as well? It's like the more people know, the less they feel they can really give you a specific response. 
Well, Pete, I'm old, so I've seen all these things come and go and come and go and come and go and seen the development in the training industry. You know, it's um, most of your listeners are perhaps young, but uh, when aerobics came onto the scene and Jane Fonda suddenly made exercise okay for women, it, it wasn't before that. It's hard to remember back to those days and how attitudes to the body were. Um, I so celebrate all this opening up of the gender stuff so that people can simply be the kind of masculine or feminine they want to be as opposed to the roles that my mother and father and their generation were stuck into. Um, there's a lot of freedom coming out in, in those kinds of terms, but there's also just a lack of connection between the body and life. We can really get stuck between our eyes and our digits and living in the in the milieu of TV and the internet. And um, it's, it's a real thing that we have to look at because we've never had a thing like the internet before. And so we're gonna have to change our relationship to our bodies relative to having an electronic culture as opposed to an industrial culture which slowed us down more from having an agricultural culture which slowed us down more from having a paleolithic culture. You can just see it if you watch the, the march of history that we're moving less and less as we get more and more convenient. And I think people are starting to observe that. And, and you know, two, the last, final two questions here. One is this trend towards, what are they called? The obstacle course racing or the, the, the America, uh, whether nin, Ninja Warrior, I think it started in Japan and it's matriculated over here. But the whole idea of these exercises where people climb, jump, they crawl, how do you think – how does that affect the body? Is that kind of a smarter way to approach movement? Is that more how we're naturally designed to move? I think so. That that That's one of the – I mean that, it's a new fad, so let's see where it goes. These things all start as fads. Um, I Somebody sent me a TRX thing and I hung it up over in my room and I started using it as a, a standard piece of equipment just, you know, using my body weight to determine my pull-ups or push-ups or whatever. Um, and then I just started experimenting with it, and now I, I take it along with me to hotels because it's the, the lightest thing to put in my suitcase uh, besides a jump rope and and hang it over the hotel door and play stretches on it. I, uh, I use it as a gym. Um, you were talking about Robert Schleip a while before. There are just so many great people uh, working in this field, and Robert's one of them. And uh, so just by holding on to the handles and working my body in a, in a stretch, <laughs> I'll put in a plug here for my anatomy trains line. You know, you lean sideways and you get that whole lateral line and you start paying attention to it. Okay, where am I moving in my spine and where am I not moving in my spine? And uh, using, using that kind of movement to expand the amount of my body I use in any given movement rather than just, is my body strong enough to do this movement, but is my 12th and 11th rib part of this? Uh, am I killing my kidneys by doing this back bend? Am I uh, just paying attention inside? Um, <laughs> again, a lot of injuries happen when people are not paying attention to what they're feeling. They override their body, do too much, and they end up with overuse injuries. And in my experience, overuse injuries are among the hardest to, uh, to fix. And with that, and I apologize because we, I, you know, we kind of jumped in the conversation, and and I'll do an introduction before we do the full conversation. But you're known for the anatomy trains. You're known for that line of thought. You you identified twelve specific lines to the body of how the fascia connects. What got you started down that path? What was kind of the light bulb, Tom, of where you started seeing that connection, and you started kind of traveling down this journey? Uh, I had met that woman who, who changed my roommate's chest and um, that was Ida Roth and I just put myself in her way um, for the rest of her life. <laughs> I, was a, I was a trouble to her. Um, but it was still, it was a very short time, I have to say, because she, she died five years later and some of that time I was just getting my training done, getting my anatomy and physiology and getting a massage license. But um, I have really been dedicated to her work since I've studied with a lot of other people, um, but it was when I was working in the her institute that um, 
she was talking about the fascia and how the fascia connected up the whole body. Um, but every anatomy book just tells you the, the biceps goes from uh, the coracoid process down to your radius. And it's an elbow flexor and maybe a supinator. But um, if you follow the fascia north and south from there, it, you come up with these meridians, as I call them, that starts on the inside of the thumb, comes down through those muscles at the base of the thumb, across your wrist and up that bone and then into the biceps up to the coracoid process and if you keep going you get on pectoralis minor under the major there which has a fascial connection down onto the third fourth and fifth rib so it's not that there isn't a biceps it's just that the biceps is all part of something and that what i was cataloging was those longitudinal somethings that go from head to toe or from you know the beginning of the arm out to the end of the arm um and I found 12 of them. I'm sure somebody will find some others or there will be some of mine that will be changed um, when when the real research is done. But uh, it's just a map. It's a map to help people see those patterns. Um, there's a line up the front of the body, which if you can um, uh, think about it, has a lot to do with people being scared and flinching because it's your soft underbelly. So um, – if people have that kind of pattern, if they're doing training on top of that kind of pattern, it's better if they do the training to open the front, uh, let that out, and then they're not building muscles into a pattern. What we want to do is open up the pattern and then build a muscle on top of that, in my opinion. That would be what I would hope for trainers in, in the future. We'll see. And just just for listeners, this is – for me, this is – I'm kind of fanboying out right now, Tom, because – I, I first picked up – I picked up your first edition in 2007, I believe. And like I said, I saw you speak uh, in 2008 and I did your Anatomy Live um, workshop in 2013 with a good friend of mine, Michelle Dalcourt. And for listeners, it was – I would have been more than thrilled to watch you go through the dissection. But I was completely overwhelmed when we walked in there. You handed us the scalpel and the forceps and said, all right, you guys get to experience and, and do the dissection yourself. And it really has changed my perspective on the body. So if anybody really wants to understand anatomy, Tom, I'd really recommend picking up anatomy trains. Do you have workshops available that people – and I know primarily they're for professionals in the field. But how can people learn more about this concept? And I know you have a couple articles out there. But where's where's the best resource for people that this kind of piques their interest and they want to kind of dig into this a little bit more? Well um, – I'll take this opportunity to say anatomytrains.com. We have also .uk and, and .au. Uh, I have offices in, in uh, Europe and Australia, but the anatomytrains.com is where we keep up, keep putting out new research and new ideas and new videos and stuff uh, for people who want to uh, tune in on it. The uh, dissection thing, though, Pete, is just, as you say, um, uh, been very grateful to Michelle for bringing a lot of people from the training industry uh, to these dissections um, that we now do in Boulder. And uh, there is nothing like seeing for yourself. The word autopsy means see for yourself. And uh, we get all our learning from books. We get our learning from slides and people's presentations. And to actually go look at the body itself is an amazing um education in what's really going on as opposed to anatomy as it's presented in the book, which is an idea about what's going on. And we're on the, we've been an industry in industrial, I'm sorry, we've been in industrial society for so long that uh, we think of the body as a machine and no part of the body has been more turned into a machine than the muscles and the joints. Uh, just, it's all about levers and vectors and, um, as we move into thinking about more of the internet, thinking of the body as an idea or a meme or something like that, we're going to have different ways of uh, exercising it that are going to occur to us that, do, that don't occur to us if we're only thinking of the leverage idea of muscles. We've come a long way with the leverage of idea of muscles. It's been a good thing, and we've stopped a lot of injuries and gotten ourselves to break records left and right. Um, but I, I really do believe that the idea of the body is going to change away from a machine and more towards a process. And I don't know what that's going to be. We're just at the beginning of looking at the body in a new way. Well, I want to thank you. I want to thank you very much for your time. I really, really appreciate it. And for listeners, 
I, I highly recommend you can find find his books at anatomytrains.com. I'll put a couple links to those below. But if you really want to understand how your body moves, I, I urge you to pick up a copy of Tom's book because really, Tom, it, it's changed my life. And I've had surgeries due to sports. And in my 40s now, I can move pain free. In fact, the, the most pain I have is after a 12 hour flight, <laughs> you know, but if I move throughout the day, it's, 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 you know, it feels, it's easy and, and, and carefree. And I really, I attribute a lot of that to the information I've learned from, from studying your work over the years. So I really greatly appreciate what you do. And, and I really appreciate your time today. Great. Thanks very much, Pete. And uh, thanks to your listeners. Keep learning. Now, I mean it when I say that was a total fanboy moment for me, and it really, it took a little bit of time to set that interview up, and we had the conversation. Ironically, Thomas was in the, uh, I live in Encinitas, California, and Thomas was in the area visiting uh, for for uh, a private function, and we didn't get a chance to meet in person, which is fine, but that still was the best time for us to get on, to get on a Skype call, and I really appreciate his time. He's extremely busy. He travels around the world lecturing. He teaches workshops. And I really appreciate his time because what I'm trying to bring to you is a different understanding of exercise. I've had a variety of different guests on, you know, most recently it was Todd Wright, the strength coach of the Philadelphia 76ers back in episode 123, really talking about how there's an approach towards movement first to doing a movement first approach to exercise, meaning work on squat, lunge, push, pull, rotation, because we understand that the body, the muscles don't work in isolation. I mean, for years, We've taught this concept of exercising, you know, do biceps, I'll do quadriceps, you know, Monday is chest day, Tuesday is back and biceps. That's not how the body works. That really isn't. And you have to understand that in the fitness education world, which is why I live, about 15 to 20 years ago, education was very, very factional. You know, there are a lot of factions in education. You had people saying, do it this way. Or don't do it at all. You have people say, that's wrong. Do it this way. There's a lot of disharmony and discord between different educators like myself. But I have to say that over the last 10 or 12 years, and honestly, Mr. Myers, Thomas Myers, has been a huge component of that. Now, there's a lot more harmony. A lot of us kind of tend to agree. A lot of us that they go out and teach these workshops that, that, do different, that do different fitness education events because we've been influenced by anatomy trains. Because we've studied underneath Gary Gray, who was a guest a number of episodes back. But Gary's been teaching functional movement for years, for decades. And now a lot of us have studied under these people. And while we might, I don't even want to say disagree, we might use different tools. Obviously, my colleagues that, that teach for, that are presenters for TRX, they're going to say use a TRX to get a fitness solution, which, you know, works. I have colleagues that teach for other things. I work with Sandbells. Sandbells can provide a number of fitness solutions. If you understand movement and if you understand how the tissues of the body work, muscle and fascia, then you really will have a much better understanding of how you can use exercise to do what you want to be able to do. You'll be able to understand how to use exercise to be able to do your favorite activities. Because as Thomas said, it's, it's connective tissue, which we really overlooked for years. Both Thomas and this, uh, uh, somebody out of Germany named Robert Schleip have been instrumental. They've been very, very influential in changing how people like myself view exercise. And in turn, educators like myself are going out around the world and teaching personal trainers and fitness instructors different approaches to exercise. So yes, you might have some people that will do muscle isolation. They'll do a biceps this, they'll do an abs this. But people who are really taking the time to study, people who are taking the time to understand how the body works, are coming at it from a different point of view. We understand that we need to focus on movement. You know, think about this for a moment. Think about this. The only time you pick a weight up and set it right back down the same place is when you're at the gym. You pick up a barbell, you set it down. You pick up a dumbbell, you set it down. You're pretty much just going in a straight line with it, up and down. Now think about what you do at home. If you pick up a box, if you pick up a suitcase, if you pick up a bag, you know, a thing of, of laundry... You're moving it somewhere. You're moving a load somewhere. That requires total body strength. You can't just isolate one muscle and expect everything else around it to be strong. If you take a bicycle wheel and you tighten one spoke, it's going to throw the wheel out of alignment. If you take your body and you focus all the force 
because that's what muscles do. Muscles generate force. You lift a weight, muscles are generating a tension, generating a force to overcome the inertia of that weight. Whether that's a free weight or a machine, the muscle is generating a force. It's a contractile element of muscle that generates the force. It's a fascia and connected tissue which guides that force and controls how that force transfers around the body. That's a very important concept to understand. So yes, I work with Nautilus. Nautilus is a maker of machines. They're one of the originators of the, of the cam, pulley and cam concept. The, the benefit of using Nautilus is that you put the most load into the muscle where the muscle is the strongest. I'm a firm believer in Nautilus machines because doing resistance training is the best way to get strong and large muscles. But also we need to do movement training. Nautilus makes a line of, of cable pulley machines, a human sport. They allow you to move in multiple directions of multiple paths of movement, multiple directions. I'm not trying to sell you a Nautilus. I'm just giving you examples of how to apply it. And that's what I really recommend for your own workouts. Have a couple days a week where you lift a heavy weight. Continue to lift heavy, especially if you're over the age of 40 or 45. Lifting heavy will promote growth hormone. It'll promote testosterone. It'll help you burn calories safely. And it'll give you muscle definition. Your type 2 muscle fibers are those muscle fibers responsible for definition. They don't get activated. They don't get recruited until you work to fatigue. And you have to work to fatigue in order to use them correctly, in order to engage them. So if you want to develop muscle tone, you're in your 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. Guess what? (laughs) You got to lift heavy. You got to work to fatigue. But if you want to be injury free... If you want to be able to move and do your favorite, whatever you like to do, and do it more often with a reduced risk of injury, then pick up Anatomy Trains and learn about fascial fitness. Robert Schleip has a book, that's the name of it, Fascial Fitness. There's a different training method. I'm going to have an article I wrote recently for the American Council on Exercise on fascia, and I'll have a blog post down below that kind of highlights some of this, because you kind of have to be a geek like me to really take a deep dive into it. And I try to you know, cut and save some of that time and the articles and the blog posts I write. But I will have a, a link below to Thomas Meyer's work because if you want to take a deep dive, I, I can't recommend it enough. That is one of the books I think every personal trainer should own is Anatomy Trains, specifically the third edition. And when the fourth edition comes out, get it because it's going to take a deeper dive into it. With a book I just recently wrote, Smarter Workouts, that's what I try to do. I try to give you an overview of this. I don't, I don't go into dearly deep, a nearly deep dive like Thomas and Robert Schleip do in their books, but I try to take the practical application and give you the tools that you can design workouts on your own. I really want to thank Thomas for taking the time to come on and giving you some insight into what fascia is and why we should be more concerned about it because it really is one of those things. Nobody walks into the gym saying, hey, today's going to be the day I train fascia. Unless you've been educated by somebody like myself, Rodney Korn, Ian O'Dwyer, Michelle Dalcourt, Thomas himself, or somebody else along those lines, because that's really, if you really want to train your body to be strong, you have to think about all the tissues involved. You have to think about everything involved, not just the muscle we see on the outside, not training for mere muscle. Mere muscle may look good, but mere muscle doesn't necessarily keep you injury free. Training your fascia and your connective tissue That's the secret to injury-free. That's the secret to longevity. That can be done with Tai Chi, yoga, TRX, a variety of different methods. I found it, I was giggling that Thomas mentioned he travels with a TRX and works out with it. He doesn't know that I'm a huge fan, and I've had the the founder, Randy Hetrick, on a couple times. But I hope if he's listened to this, now he does. So hopefully you got a lot out of this episode. As you can tell, I'm a huge proponent of this line of thought. It really, it took me a while. I want to thank Aaron. I want to thank Thomas Myers for really working with me to make the schedule work. I really appreciate it. Go to anatomytrains.net. Check out his book. I really, if you want, if you want one book that you should have about exercise, don't buy mine, buy Thomas Myers. He takes a deep dive into it. I refer to it quite a bit in, in the book I wrote. And obviously, if you want to buy mine, do that as well. Smarter Workouts, it's listed below. Um, enough of that. But if you, want to, if you want to follow me on Instagram, Pete McCall underscore fitness, I've, I've been trying to post more exercise videos up where I do talk a little bit about the fascia. And you can see the difference between strength training and training for fascia. That's Pete McCall underscore fitness on Instagram. Pete MC underscore fitness is the, is the tag on Twitter. That's Pete MC underscore fitness on Twitter. And if you want to have some fun, check out my glute battle that I'm doing with Abby Apple. Abby Apple is Abby, A-B-B-I-E-A-P-P-E-L on Instagram. And she throws up glute videos, and I kind of throw glute videos back at her. We're calling it Glute Reboot. We're kind of having a 
he said, she said, little glute war. That's, that's a lot of fun. Just something we're doing is to try to put more information out there for you so that you know how to use exercise more efficiently. If you want to reach out to me, my email is Pete at Pete McCall fitness.com. I've been busy with a bunch of things. I'm getting back into the podcasting schedule. I have a killer feature coming out about how science is hacking exercise. And I really look forward to getting that together. Madeline uh, my, McCormick, my, my producer, is helping me with that. Thanks for stopping by. And I look forward to having you join me for future episodes of All About Fitness.